Happy Monday. It has been a big Monday. <laughs> well, if you have your Bibles, if you will, turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. I'll remember it this time. While I'm trying to get this thing on, it's 2 Kings, chapter 5, and verse 1. Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right, that's second. There we go. Second Kings chapter five, beginning at verse one. You'll you'll notice that there's going to be a theme here. I, I spoke last night for those who were here uh, with us last night. Um, the topic in which the Lord laid upon my heart to speak upon um, during this time of revival uh, was the subject of perseverance and of being persistent. Uh, the importance of being persistent in the faith. And we're going to see a theme because last night I was in the book of 1 Kings and tonight we're going to find ourselves in the book of 2 Kings chapter 5 and we're going to look at this topic of persistence once again but looking at it from a different perspective. And we're going to look at the life of a man named Naaman. And it's in 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 1. And this is the word of our God. It says, Naaman, commander of the army for the king of Aram, was a man important to his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was a valiant warrior, but he had a skin disease. Let us pray over the word of our God. Father, I do pray for your strength and I pray for your grace. I pray for your wisdom and I pray that you would speak through me. Father, I come tonight as your vessel. And I pray that you would fill me with your spirit and with your presence and with your knowledge and with your wisdom so that you may be glorified and that you may be exalted. Father, my desire above all things is that you would be praised and that you would be seen and felt in this place tonight. So, Father, I pray that you would humble me and I pray that you would help me because without you and apart from you, I can do absolutely nothing. Uh, as you say in your word that you are the vine and we are the branches and apart from you, we can do nothing. And so, Father, I do pray that you would help me and that you would fill me with your presence and with your spirit this night so that your people may be fed, so that your sheep may be encouraged, so that your people may be edified by your holy and inerrant and infallible word. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, it is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. Father, it leads us, it guides us, it directs us, it fills us with your wisdom and with your knowledge. And so, Father, help us to hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Father, we love you this night, and we ask once again that you would have your way in this place and that everything that is done would be for the exaltation of your holy name. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. And the church of the living God said together, Amen. Amen. So we're looking at this man named Naaman. And as we look here in, in chapter 5 and verse 1, it speaks about him being a commander of the army for the king of Aram. And it speaks about him being a very important man, a very successful man. This was, this was a man who had uh, a great deal of authority. He was a commander of the army, and it was a powerful army at that. He was a very successful man, a man who was um, high up in the dominance hierarchy. So he was a man who uh, was lifted up and who was exalted. He gave orders and people listened to him. When he approached people, uh, they felt, they knew that he was a man of authority. He was a commander of this great army. And it says that he was important to his master and he was highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. And so it's speaking about the character of Naaman and how he was this great and how he was this mighty and successful man. And then it says the man was a valiant warrior. But then we see that it turns and it says, but he had a skin disease. So here's this man who had such power and such authority, who was so successful and so highly regarded, but yet underneath, Underneath all of the medals, 
underneath all of uh, the attire that he wore. He had this skin disease that was literally tearing him apart. And so this teaches us something, that even the most uh, seemingly successful and powerful and those who were high up in, in the dominant hierarchy, even those people who were up at the very top, it's not always what it seems. There are things that they are dealing with that you don't know about. And there are things even in our own lives that, that, are, that we deal with that are that we deal with in the innermost part of our being that not many people know about. And Naaman was this man. He was, had this disease, and you, you would have to imagine that he had to be very self-conscious about this. Because he was such a commanding and, and domineering man and figure, he had to be self-conscious about having this disease that was, that was, that was tearing him apart. Uh, leprosy especially back in, in the time in which this was written, th there are cures for it now, but back then, when, you, when somebody had leprosy, they would take them and they would make them into an outcast. They would go outside of the city. And so that's why the lepers would be sitting out. And when Jesus was walking upon the earth, the lepers would have to cry out and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. And so Naaman had this dreadful disease that was hidden behind this uh, this success that he had. And so it had to make him very self-conscious and, and it was tearing him apart. And so here is this successful, valiant, mighty warrior that had this thing that was tearing at him every single day. And this is incredible because here's a man who was a commander who had this, this dreadful disease that, that had to make him, uh, it will make you weary and it amazes me. There are some people, and it, there are some people who have uh, illnesses and infirmities that attack their body every single day. And when you have that kind of that kind of sickness and that kind of illness that attacks your body every single day, this is something that Naaman never had any relief from. It's something that he had to carry with him every single day. And when you're carrying something like that every single day of your life, it will teach you persistence. It will teach you perseverance. And it amazes me people who have these kind of ailments and these kind of infirmities that still get up every single morning because Naaman could have said, woe is me. I'm going to lay here in the bed and I'm not going to do anything because I'm afflicted with this disease. But he got up and he was a commander of the army even though he was afflicted with that, that illness. And there are some people in here who may deal with an infirmity that, that just tears at you every single day and, and reminds you every single day of its presence. But you still continue to get up and you still continue to move. And God honors that. God seen this in Naaman, and God was about to do a work with Naaman because not only did Naaman have leprosy that, that was eating away at him, he also had something even more deadly than leprosy that was eating away at his innermost part, at his heart. And we will see that Naaman had an issue with pride. And it's something that we all deal with. It's something that, that man deals with. Uh, the sin of pride. It is prevalent in every single son of Adam and daughter of Eve. We are, we are the sons of Adam, and the root of our problem, the root of many of our problems that we deal with, the rudimentary issue is pride. It is pride that got Satan kicked out of heaven because he tried to exalt himself above the Most High God. He said, I will exalt myself. And we see Nebuchadnezzar who tried to lift himself up and he said, look at this great kingdom Babylon in which I have built and it's all I, I, me, me. Look at what I have done. And what did God do to Nebuchadnezzar? He brought him down and caused him to eat grass like a beast in the field. So whenever we lift ourselves up and we begin to exalt ourselves, that's why the scripture says in Proverbs that pride comes before a fall. And so God is about to do something with Naaman to humble him. And it's going to take a great deal of work because pride is, the roots grow deep. It's not some little weed that can just be lifted, up, lifted out easily. No, the roots go down deep and it takes time in order to get that 
out of our heart. It is something that will take all of our lives. Until we get to heaven, we will be dealing with that issue of pride. That's how prevalent it is in the heart of man. But God was going to deal with this issue with Naaman, with his leprosy, but also with the leprosy of his heart that was eating away at him. Because, because any time you get any sense of success, it can go to your head. And that's exactly what was happening with Naaman. This kind of success was going to Naaman's head, and he was beginning to exalt himself and, and, and think of himself as better than others. And God, any time that that happens with us, God has a merciful way of bringing us down because nobody likes anybody, who, nobody likes people who exalt themselves above others and who are constantly having this sense in which they are looking down on others as if they are inferior. And so God was going to deal with Naaman's heart and also with his leprosy. So it says in verse 2 that Aram had gone on raids and brought back from the land of Israel a young girl who served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master were the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. Now this is incredible here. Uh, do, do you notice what happens here? There is this little, little slave girl who was from Israel. So she was taken away as a young girl. Aram, go, uh, Aram goes in and raids, and they take this little girl and bring her in, and Naaman takes her as a slave. She is stripped away from her home. She is stripped away from her country. She is stripped away from her family. She is stripped away from everything that she had grown up around. And now she is in this different environment with, these, with this different culture, with these different people, and serving them as a slave. And this little girl looks at Naaman's leprosy and says, I know a man who can heal you of that. You say, how in the world does somebody do something like that? Have you ever had anybody to hurt you? Have you ever had anybody to do something to, to harm you, to inflict you, to, to, to try, to, 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 try to, to bring you down? I can, I can say pretty much with confidence, nobody's ever taken you in as a slave. That's pretty low. Nobody's ever stripped you away from your family and took took you to a different country, to a different people. This is exactly what happens to this girl. And if that happened to you, I, I'm thinking about myself, and, and this may show the condition of my heart. If somebody did that to me, I would be thinking, well, yeah, let the leprosy just to take him over. He, look at what he did. There, people would say, well, that's just karma. What goes around comes around. He took me away from my home. He took me away from my family. Now let the leprosy devour him. Let it, let it take him out. This young girl looks... Even though she is a slave, this tells me something. She is freer than Naaman will ever be. Yeah. She is a free girl. This is what true freedom is. Even though she is there as a slave, she is free because she has forgiveness in her heart to look at this person who wronged her and said, I know how you can be healed. I have the answer to your healing. And here's the thing. There are people who will hurt you, who will abuse you, and, we can, and, and the gospel is this. We can look at those people and say, I know how you can be saved. I know how your leprosy can be healed. I know because leprosy is also synonymous with sin. Because as leprosy eats away at an individual, so sin eats at our heart. It, 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 it tears us apart, if you will. And so we can say to other people, even though they may want to cause us harm or, or to, to try to cause pain and suffering in our lives and try to make us as miserable as possible, we can look at those people and say, there is one who can save your soul. I can tell you the one who can free you of your leprosy, who can free you of your sins, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here she says, I know who can heal you. And then so Naaman, verse 4, so Naaman went and told his master what the girl from the land of Israel had said. Therefore the king of Aram said, go, and I will send you a letter with you to the king of Israel. So he went and took with him 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. He brought the, leather to the, brought the letter to the king of Israel, and it read, When this letter comes to you, note that I have sent you my servant Naaman, for you to cure him of his skin disease. Now notice, this little girl says that there's a prophet in Israel who can heal you of your disease. Now the king of Aram says, 
It, because you have to think about it. When these people exalt themselves as kings, that's just like in Egypt. When you would have a king, they would be a pharaoh. They would consider the kings as the gods that they would be God. And so this little slave girl says, there is a prophet in Israel who can heal you. And the king of Aram and Naaman hears this, and they say, well, I'm not going to go to the prophet. I'm going to go to the king of Israel. And not only that, he takes with him all of this silver, all of this gold, all of these sets of clothing. He is going with a payment saying, look at my wealth, look at my status, look at all that I have, and I'm going to give this to you, and then you're going to heal me. He's wanting to make it as extravagant as possible. He is wanting to show the king, this is how powerful I am. And he goes to the king saying, I want you to heal me because you are high up in, in the hierarchy. And so he says, I, I, he goes to the king instead of to little humble Elisha. And so it says that he brought, in verse 6, he brought the letter to the king of Israel, and it read, when this letter comes to you, note that I have sent you my servant Naaman for you to cure him of his skin disease. And in verse 7, look at how the king of Israel reacts to this. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes. When you tear your clothes, you are, you're pretty angry. Um, I've seen people pretty upset, but I've never seen anybody tear their clothes. This man was upset. He was angry, at, and he says, and he asked, this is very wise what he says, am I God, killing and giving life, that this man expects me to cure a man of his skin disease? He looks and he says, the only person who can do this is God. The king of Israel realizes, I am not a God. I cannot do this. And then he says, recognize that he is only picking a fight with me. He thinks that the king of Aram is just trying to pick a fight with him. In the verse 8, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. So news goes around pretty quickly there in, in Israel. Uh, people were probably picking up the phones and saying, did you hear what the, what the king did today? Could you imagine if that happened? And if all of a sudden uh, you turn on the news and you see the president just in, in an interview and then just ripping his, tearing his clothes off and, and that happening, it would, it would travel around pretty quickly. That's exactly what happens with the king of Israel. He tears his clothes, he's upset, and, and this, travels, this news travels to Elisha. And Elisha hears about this, and he says, why have you torn your clothes? Have him come to me, meaning you just calm down, simmer down. He says, have him come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Still, Naaman is here. This is a prideful, arrogant man. He comes with his horses and his chariots. He brings, he is just showing forth all of his wealth. He's coming with his, with his horses and his chariots. In our day, it would be his, his Mercedes Benz. He's riding up, and, and he's not just one. There's just, he's bringing a whole fleet of them and just coming in saying, look at, look at what I have, just showing his power and saying, this is why you should heal me because look at how successful and how powerful I am. Naaman was a prideful man. And so here he is standing at the door of Elisha's house. And so what God's going to do is God's really going to humble this man. And he's really going to bring him down low. In verse 10 it says, Then Elisha sent him a messenger who said, Go wash seven times in the Jordan, and your skin will be restored, and you will be clean. So this sounds pretty simple. Uh, you can't get any more simple than that. He says, You want to be cured of your leprosy? Go down to the Jordan River and dip yourself in the river seven times and you will be clean. And you notice how, how he says, don't dip yourself in at one time. It's just like last night when Elijah, prayed, how many, when Elijah prayed, how many times did he pray? Seven times before the cloud came. And so here is the same thing that's being repeated here. He tells him to wash in the Jordan seven times. He is teaching Naaman that God seeks after persistence. He wants us to be persistent in our faith. And so here... Elisha sends a messenger, and then it sounds pretty straightforward, pretty simple. You would think that Naaman would be excited about this. Could you imagine having this disease that afflicted you and that caused you pain and suffering, and somebody says, well, here's the way to do it. Go and dip yourself in that river seven times, and, and God will heal you. But verse 11, something very strange happens, which shows us, which just 
plunges us into the heart of Naaman and shows us just what kind of man he was and just what God was trying to do with him. And verse 11 says, But Naaman got angry and left, saying, I was telling myself, he will surely come out. Stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the skin disease. Now notice what he says here. He says, I had it in my mind. I was telling myself that the first thing that he says, I want us to really pay attention to this and break this down to get into the mind of Naaman. He says, the first thing that I thought he was going to do is that he was going to come out and see me. This is why he was bringing all of his wealth, all of his money, all of his gold, all of his chariots. He wanted Elisha to stand out and say, look at me. He was just like, just like flashing light saying, look over here at me. This was an insecure man. Even though he had so much, that leprosy of sin was eating at his heart and he was an insecure individual. And so he is saying, Elisha, come look at me. It's just like a little kid saying, pay attention to me. And Elisha's in there, sitting on the recliner. The preacher's there. This, this humble, lowly preacher is sitting there and won't even go out to meet Naaman. Won't even step out the door of his house. And Naaman gets upset. This bothers him because Naaman is a commander. Naaman is somebody who was always giving orders. Naaman is a prideful man who is used to people coming and just bowing down to him, saying, Oh, Naaman, and Elisha doesn't give him the time of day. And this humbles Naaman, and he says, I thought surely he would come out to see me. And he gets upset because God is trying to humble Naaman. He is trying to heal him completely, not just of his physical infirmity, but of his disease of pride that is eating away at him, that will eat at him even faster than his natural disease that he has of leprosy. It's, it's eating away at him, and so God tells Elisha, don't go out to him. Stay where you are. And so Naaman gets angry. And notice how he phrases this. He says, I was telling myself he will surely come out, stand, and call on the name of the Lord as God, and wave his hand over the place and cure the skin disease. He, he already had it in his mind how God was going to answer the prayer. And here's the thing. We also can be guilty of being like Naaman in this regard. We say, Lord, I prayed this prayer and I thought, surely this is the way you were going to answer it. I thought this was the way that you were going to respond. I prayed that you would do this, but now you're doing that. I thought that surely you were going to come and, and do something different, but now you are doing something completely different from what I thought, and it offends us, and, and we get angry. And that's exactly what happened to Naaman. He got angry, not just at Elisha, but at God. And he was saying, I thought this was how God was going to work. And here's the thing. If you ever begin to tell yourself and you ever start uh, saying to yourself, this is how God's going to do such and such, and you start trying to give God orders, that's what Naaman was trying to do. He wanted to give Elisha the orders to say, this is how God's going to do this. This shows us right here, he was a prideful man. And any time we get in that position, God will knock us down. He will knock us down out of mercy and out of grace. And so he says, I thought he was going to wave his hand over the place and cure the skin disease. And verse 12, aren't Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? He says, isn't there a more... Isn't there a cleaner way that I can, isn't there a cleaner river that I can go into? He says, the Jordan River, that's like somebody telling you to go, that's like having this beautiful river that, that he's thinking of rivers that flow through that are just beautiful. Think about the rivers that flow through New Zealand, just crystal clear, just beautiful water where you can see the fish and you can see the trout swimming in there. It's, it's just clear water. He says, it, it would make more sense to, for me to be dipped in that water, and that's what's going to make me clean. He says, look at the rivers in my own homeland. He says, why couldn't I just wash in there? You want to bring me to the dirty Jordan River 
in our terms, something we'll understand, meaning you're going to take me and dump me in the call call. Th that's what you're going to do. <laughs> you want me to go there instead of going to New Zealand and, and dumping in there. Nothing against the call call. I love that place more than life. <laughs> but he is saying, I, he says, there are other rivers that I can go into that are cleaner. And he says, can't I, can't I just go and wash in there? And a lot of people even say that about the Lord Jesus. They say, isn't there another way that I can be cleansed from my sin? Isn't there a cleaner way? All of the blood that you're talking about and that you sing about in your hymns and all of the, the, the blood of Jesus and the cross, it all sounds so gory and it all sounds so dirty and it all sounds so, so nasty. Isn't there, isn't there a, a cleaner, more, uh, more precise way that we can be saved that, that, that we can just steer away from all of that talk? No. That's exactly what Elisha was saying to him. He says, there is no other river that you can go to. There is no other place that you can go to to find cleansing from your leprosy. And it's the same thing with us. There is no other fountain that we can go to. There is no other name that is given among men by which they can be saved except for the blood of Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to the Father but by him. And Elisha was trying to tell him there is a singular way. There's only one way. Just like Noah in the flood. If you want to be saved from the flood, you've got to come on the ark. There's no other way. It is the only way to be redeemed. There's one way. It's not all of this diversity and saying there are multiple ways to get to heaven. No, it's the exclusivity of the gospel, that Jesus Christ is the only way. That's the way to heaven. That's the way to be cleansed of your leprosy. And he says, he basically says to him, you have two choices. You can either bow and say, all right, I'm going to go and I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to go and wash in this river. Or you can refuse and say, well, I don't like that there's only one way, so therefore I'm going to go and do it my own self. But he says, go and do what you will, but you will not be cured of your leprosy. Go and try to cleanse yourself some other way. Go and try to lift yourself up by your bootstraps. Go and try to clean your own leprosy up. Go and try to heal yourself, physician. See what you can do. See what kind of power you have. And so that's what God says to us. He sets before us life and death and says, here it is. And instead of us complaining about there only being one way, let us be thankful that God even made a way. He could have left us without any choices. He could have told Naaman, go back where you came from. You have a slave. You have this, this person that you're abusing. And, and he, he could have pointed out all of his sins and all of his shortcomings and all of his failings. But he said, no, there is forgiveness and healing for you, Naaman. And God says that even to the prideful and the arrogant, he says there is a way to be saved and a way to be redeemed. No matter what sins you have committed, you have to come to the river. To the river I am going, bringing sins I cannot bear. And that's why we sung that song tonight, because it's a reflection of what is here. He says, come to the river. But he turns away and he leaves in rage because he didn't like God's answer. He didn't like God's way. And this is the choices that we have. Many people look at the Word of God and they say, well, I don't like that passage, and I don't like how God did that, and I think God should have done that differently, and I think that I, I don't like the Word of God because of this certain passage that is in it. And you try to cherry pick, and you try to say, well, I, I, I'm going to turn away, and I'm going to leave in rage. And God, here's the thing. He's still God even if we do that. It doesn't change him. It doesn't affect him. It doesn't, he doesn't say, he doesn't wring his hands and say, oh no, so and so's mad at me. They don't like the way that I did that. I better, no, God, he do, as the scripture says, our Lord is in the heavens. He does whatever pleases him. Hey. And so verse 13, his servants come to him and, and, and they, his servants are finally at a breaking point. His servants look and they finally say, they say, we've got to do something about this man. Healing is right there in front of him. All he has to do is go there and he can be healed. We need to, we need to open up his eyes. In verse 13, but his servants approached and said to him, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more so should you do it when he only tells you, wash and be clean? They look at him and they get to the root of the problem. 
And they say, listen, Naaman, they know him so well. They've got him, I, they have got him down to a T. They know him. They know his heart. They know what makes him tick. They know so much about Naaman by spending time around him. And they say, Naaman, if he would have told you to do something great, you would have done it. And here's the thing. A lot of people are the same way with the cross. A, a, a big stumbling block that people have in coming to Jesus is that it's so simple. Jesus literally says, come to me. Call upon my name and I will save you. Confess your sins, confess your iniquities, repent, and I will save you. That's, it's simple. But yet a lot of people say, well, I want to do something great. What they're basically saying, like Naaman, is I want to be my own savior. I want to cleanse my own leprosy. I want to get the glory out of it. Because you see, when you look to Jesus and you say, you're my savior, you are dethroning yourself. And that's the essence of pride. Pride exalts yourself. It puts yourself on a throne in which you are the commander. You are the captain of your soul and of your destiny. And, and when you turn to Jesus, you get off the throne and you look and you say, you are exalted. You are the king. You are the savior. I can't save myself. There's nothing inherently good in me in which I can earn or receive salvation. I need a savior. I need you. And so you have to switch places to get off the throne and to exalt him and say you are the one that is to be praised and that is a humbling thing for us to do and that's what leads many people away from Jesus because they say well I want to do something which I can boast in my salvation I, it, and so they say well here's how I'll earn salvation I'll give such and such amount of money to this uh, to this charity or I'll do such and such work for this organization or I'll volunteer this many hours listen I have met many people who have said I need to volunteer and I need to do this because I want to go to heaven and the gospel is that's completely opposite of the gospel you come to Jesus and you say, Lord, I need you to save me. There is no amount of good that I can do. There, are no, um, there is no amount of work that I can do to save myself. I need you to save me, to redeem me. And then when you realize that he cleansed you of your sin and he cleansed you of your iniquity, then you want to go out and work by faith and do and live for him and serve him, not because you think that by doing that you're going to earn salvation, but because you know he has saved you and it changes your heart and your affections so that then you delight in serving him and obeying him and following him. So therefore, you don't work to get saved. You're, you're saved and that therefore leads you into doing works for him. The works in which he has predestined us to walk in, as Ephesians says. And so he looks and he begins to think about this. They say, his, his servants are talking to him and say, he told you something so simple. Just wash and be cleansed. And Naaman's thinking about it, and, and in verse 14 it says, so Naaman went down. It's very interesting how it phrases that. So Naaman went down. Naaman was always going up. He was always trying to exalt himself. He was always trying to climb the ladder to get up higher and higher and higher. But Jesus says the way of the cross is you've got to go down. And then by going down, he then lifts you up. And so he goes down. It says, so Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times according to the command of the man of God. Then his skin was restored and became like the skin of a small boy, and he was clean. And you notice how it does this. It, it, it's... It, it changes Naaman. It changes him from, and this is a picture of baptism. In the Old Testament, you think, well, baptism is, is all in the New Testament. But e this is a picture, even before Jesus came, and you see John the baptizer baptizing Jesus and baptizing the disciples. And, and, and here is Naaman. In the Old Testament, it's a picture of somebody who was prideful and who was arrogant, who was baptized into the Jordan, water, into the Jordan waters and baptized into that river. And when he comes up, his skin is like that of a small boy. He is humbled. He goes down a commander, and then he comes up a servant. Because when you come to Jesus, you are no longer in charge. 
He is now in charge. And he comes up as this servant, as this small boy, and he is cleansed and he is made new. He is restored. And isn't it incredible that of all the rivers that Elisha could have told him to go and be baptized in, it was the Jordan River. And what river was it that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, whenever he went to be baptized, and John the Baptist was saying, wait just a second, you should be baptizing me. And he says, and eventually he agrees, and he says, okay, I'll baptize you. And he was baptized in what river? The Jordan River. Not the rivers of Damascus. Not the cleaner rivers but in the Jordan River. And to, to think that Naaman didn't want to step foot in the Jordan River, but the king of all kings came and stepped foot in that dirty water. That was just a picture of what he was going to do. Jesus steps into our mess. Jesus, the one who was completely clean, the one who was without any spot or any blemish, goes and steps into the river and then was baptized in that dirty water. And that's exactly what he did on the cross. The clean, spotless Lamb of God bore our iniquities and our leprosy, if you will, on the cross. He bore our sins and iniquities, and he bore it all upon himself so that those who trust in Jesus can cast our sins upon him, and then in exchange we receive his right righteousness. His perfect life is then accounted unto us. It is the great exchange. There's no greater exchange than that. Jesus says, you give me your rags and I'll give you beauty. You give me your sins, you cast them all upon me and I will give you my righteousness. So Jesus, this picture here of Naaman being baptized in the Jordan River is a picture of salvation. Is being Naaman, the old Naaman, is dying, and he's going to be raised up to walk in newness of life. And so he comes up a new man. And then verse 15, Then Naaman and his whole company went back to the man of God and stood before him and declared, I know there's no God in the whole world except in Israel. You see, the reason why God does the things that he does and the reason why God didn't answer in the way that Naaman thought he should is so that God in the end will receive all of the glory. Because when Naaman went down into that dirty river and he came back as clean and as white as snow, everybody who was watching realized that was of God. That's nothing that a man could do. And so Naaman goes and he dips himself down, but he dips himself down seven times. And how humbling that had to be in front of his servants, in front of people that, that respected him and, and, and honored him and, and took orders. Here is Naaman having to take orders from Elisha and, and, and going down in this dirty water time after time after time until he finally came up after that, pers after that perseverance and persistence and he came forth a clean man. But then he says, I know there's no God in the world except in Israel. Therefore, please accept a gift from your servant. And so now he wants to pay Elisha for what had happened. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives in, whom, in whose presence I stand, I will not accept it. Naaman urged him to accept it, but he refused. And so Naaman's here. He is trying to, he's trying to purchase it. He's trying to say, this great and mighty thing happened to me. What can I do to repay you for this, this great miracle happening? He is trying to pay Elisha for what happened. And he says, do not give me a dime because I want you to realize that you were not saved by your monetary value. But You are not saved by what is in your bank account. You are not saved by what you can give. But you are saved by free, unmerited grace and by grace grace alone you are saved. He wanted him to realize that above all things that we are not saved by anything that we can give but because the Son of God gave his life so that we might have salvation. So here he was trying to give a gift for his healing. I know many preachers on the television who would have jumped right on that and said, oh, give me all you got. <laughs> they would have went and got water out of the Jordan River and put it in bottles and sold it on, on and sold it for, what, $50 a, a piece. <laughs> but he says, no, it's all of grace. It's all of God's unmerited favor and mercy. Naaman urged him to accept it, but he refused. 
And then verse 17, I want you to see how Naaman has changed in an instant. Naaman goes from being this, this prideful, arrogant man to being changed instantly, in which he says in verse 17, Naaman responded, If not, please let your servant be given as much soil as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will no longer offer a burnt offering or a sacrifice to any other god but the Lord. So he says, I want you to give me all the soil that you have from this place. This place that he once said, this is a dump. <laughs> he said, I, need to go, I could go back home. I've got better stuff home. Now he is begging Elisha, let me take a piece of what you have here back to Damascus with me. And so this shows just how much he has changed. And he says, let me take this soul back with me, and I'm going to offer up a, a, a burnt offering. As soon as God saves him and changes him, do you realize what he wants to do? He then wants to give unto the Lord. He says, now, I, I, because God done this for me, I know there's no other God but the Lord, and I have to do something to serve him. You see, when God changes you in that way, the first thing that you say is, I've got to tell somebody. I've got to do something. I've got to, there's, it's just like the woman at the well. When Jesus comes to the woman at the well, and she is this, this woman who is just, has so many uh, sins and, and is just in a mess, and Jesus comes to her and, and tells her everything about her life, and, and eventually he says to her, come to me and you'll never thirst again. Meaning, come to me and I'll cleanse you of your leprosy, I'll cleanse you of your sin. And so she, she is saved, she is redeemed, and she goes out and she tells everyone, about a man who knew everything about her and who saved her and redeemed her. This is exactly what Naaman is doing. He says, when I go back home, he says, I'm not going to forget the one who saved me and who redeemed me. Oh, Naaman was humbled. And then verse 18, look at how, this is, this is incredible, and I close with this. When God saves you, it's incredible. This, this passage, it always strikes me every single time that I read it. He gets very particular. He says, he begins to think about things. Listen, when Jesus saves you, your whole mindset changes. You begin to think, you, you, you begin to think and you say, wait a second. There's something that I did before that I need to stop doing. Um, there's something that I, there's some sin that I had in my life, and, and now it begins to convict you. Naaman was just saved and redeemed. His heart was just changed, and as soon as he is changed and redeemed, he begins to be convicted about things that didn't even faze him before. Isn't that incredible? Because he is given a new heart. He's given a new mind, new affections, new desires, and he gets up out of that water, and he says, because God did this for me, things now have to change. And not because, not out of some legalistic way, it, and this is incredible, he's not changing, he's not changing in order to get healed from his leprosy. He's not changing in order to have the leprosy removed from him, saying, if I change and if I do this and if I keep these commands, then I will be healed. No, he is healed of his leprosy already. He says, it's already been done, and therefore, now I want to do all of this for the glory of God. So God changes us and saves us and redeems us, and we don't go out and live for God so that we can continue to keep getting saved, but because we are redeemed, and because we are saved, because we are cleansed. And so Naaman says in verse 18, however, in a particular ma matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master, the king of Aram, goes into the temple of Ramon to bow in worship while he is leaning on my arm and I have to bow in the temple of Ramon when I bow in the temple of Ramon may the Lord pardon your servant in this matter so he said to him go in peace Naaman looks and he begins to think about particulars and he says I'm going to go back home and when I go back home my master worships a different God but whenever he goes in the temple and he bows, he says, I'm going to have to, to, to hold him and, and to bow with him. But, but whenever I bow down, know that I'm not bowing down to that God. I know that he is not the true God. I'm just helping my master. It's incredible. That detail that he thought about as soon as he was saved and redeemed, he began to think, everything has changed. And I can't help but think, that what would have happened 
had Naaman been walking because you know that uh, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Listen, and I promise I'm, I'll close with this point here. My, my watch is broken, so. <laughs> Whenever Naaman goes back to Damascus, uh, he's going to be different on the outside and on the inside. When you're saved, when, when the Lord changes you, people notice. They say, what, what happened to you? You're changed. You're different. Naaman was then going to go back to the king, and you think the king wasn't going to notice that his leprosy is now gone? I mean, that's something that's evident. And so he's, the king would probably look at him and say, well, what happened to you? And while they're there walking to the temple of Ramon, there was probably many a time that Naaman said, King, there's a God who healed me of my leprosy, and it's nothing that Ramon could ever do. There's a God who saved me by, by asking me to dump myself in the dirty Jordan River, and he saved me. Let me tell you about him. And who knows what impact Naaman could have had upon the king. And who knows what impact that you may have upon your family members, upon those in which you work with, upon those in which you go to church with, upon those in which you live with. People will see a difference. People will notice that you have been changed. And when you are a Christian, here's the thing, you cannot hide it. And Naaman understood that he could not hide it. And it was going to be evident and it could have cost Naaman. It could have caused Naaman to possibly lose his position. It could have caused him, Naaman, to speak to the king and talk to him about Yahweh, the God of Israel, and he could have said, you're no longer the commander of this army. Sometimes when we come to, to the Lord Jesus, we have to be persistent even in the midst of suffering and even in the midst of losing things that were once dear. But because God, because God changed Naaman's heart, Naaman could have said, let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. His word endures forever. He could have said, my position and my dominance and being a commander is nowhere near as important as being redeemed and being cleansed and being saved. He was now like that young little slave girl. He was free. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Pastor Jason for a time of invitation.